In this episode of Marketing Against the Grain, we talk to G, the founder of Hyper Growth Partners, the advisor to many great B2B companies. And we go deep into how growth marketing is going to change in an AI world, why first mover advantage has never been so important, how you can be one of the companies who win in that AI world with personalization at scale, and why G thinks the role of a growth marketer is going to completely transform in that AI world. Stay tuned for Marketing Against the Green. Welcome to another episode of Marketing Against the Grain. I am your co-host, as always, Kieran Flanagan, CMO over at Zapier. I am not joined by my co-host, Kip Bodner, who is otherwise engaged, but that does not matter because we have an incredible guest today. We have the wizard of B2B, founder at Hyper Growth Partners, G. G, welcome onto the show. Thanks for having me. So G, you have worked at incredible companies. You do advisory for the likes of Ramp. You've worked at Drift. You're an investor. And I think you're one of the few people who actually do real growth. Like most growth marketers mm -hmm. do performance marketing. Whenever you tell me some of the things you're doing, you're actually doing like real growth marketing, real growth initiatives. And that is why we wanted to talk to you about where growth is going in the era of AI. And you did a recent article. I thought it was a really great article where you went through a kind of how people should think about this. And so let's start at the start, the start of that article, maybe bring our audience through, as you see it, the evolution of like growth and marketing, where we've come from and where you think we maybe are going in the world of AI. Yeah, absolutely. First, I mean, I've been incredibly lucky I've, I've, as you put it, but also like I've been doing this more than 15 years. That that gives me a certain vantage point, which is uncommon. And, and that's why I think I can, with fairly good confidence, try to like create a framework around what I've seen over the past 15 years or, or even a bit more, right? So I'd say in the, in the early 2000s, when I was just getting started working on like online sales, the, the first like cycle that we observed was very obviously like the the happening of Salesforce and all of the cloud computing and single use case SaaS, right? And Salesforce is not the only one. There's a couple of, of others, right? But you can see Salesforce, you can see all of those tools like HubSpot, which I believe arrived just a bit on the later end of that of that phase from right. 2000, 2008. And, and all of those single use case SaaS, right? That's the first cycle of migration. Just for context, when I started working at Apple in the early 2000s, we were selling software in boxes. So <laughs> that brings us way back, right? Way, way back. Old school. <laughs> Old school, okay? And then after that cycle, or like that seven-year cycle, we have another like kind of like seven-year cycle, which obviously was like kind of, let's say, empowered or, or generated by the 2008 economic crisis, right? And that created a, a new cycle, which is, you know, between the iPhone and all the rest of the mobile computing, mobile gaming happening, and that crisis that created like the mobile, the social, and the SaaS bundling, right? And it's very important to understand that SaaS goes through those like technological cycles as well as this bundling, unbundling cycle, right? And, and they happen at different times. Bundling, unbundling tends to be a bit shorter, and technological shifts are a bit longer. So technological shifts are going to be like seven, 10 years, if you look at the past three, four ones, and the bundling and bundling is more like three to five years, right? So the 2007, 2015 is you have this, this move towards mobile and this SaaS bundling. And we have very obviously that Kieran, in your previous life, you saw that yourself at HubSpot, right? You saw HubSpot go from a single use case SaaS to like something that wanted to and eventually was able to do a lot of the stack for marketers, a whole lot, right? And HubSpot is not the only one. You can see like the, the Zendesk, but also like see a lot of those different platforms, right? Towards the end of 2015, 2016, and that's, I personally come into play here, you have the unbundling through data analytics, data capture, this huge unbundling. And, and that's a very, that's a fascinating one. It's maybe one I know better because I've, I was personally involved at Segment. Right. But Segment and a couple of others by say, 
being a, a central point for all of the data, user data, enabled marketers like myself, and I'm sure maybe like a lot of the listeners here today, to pick the tools they wanted and be able to pick the, the best for small categories, small things, right? In email, in ads, in website, because the data was easy to move around. There was no longer the kind of friction that we had before. And then in 2016, 2022, which is where we're kind of like where we're now, I'd say we have, let's say, the end of this cycle. Now, we've unbundled so much. And I'm sure you all of you have seen like the, the chief MarTech images with yeah. like the gazillion of like SaaS products. Like 11,000 right? different MarTech products or something. Yeah, exactly. And that's getting crazy, right? right. You can't, you th that doesn't work anymore, right? Because like, it's not so much that there's low friction. It's like, where's my data? Where, have <laughs> you, where, where is it, right? It exists everywhere. Where, how can I bring it back? And, and there's multiple like CDP platforms that want to be the central point, all right? And so you have multiple CDPs, which is crazy, which is completely crazy. And so we're probably going to go back into a bundling cycle, which conveniently is happening, empowered by the shift towards AI. Right. And so and the other thing you said, so if we go through those three phases, the fourth is going to be the AI that we're talking about, the cloud computing, the mobile and social, the data analytics. I think the first that cloud computing, you kind of said, hey, it's very, that was a very marketing and sales led type of initiative, mobile and social. That's when you started to see these first growth teams kind of pop up in these companies that Really, that's, that's yeah, correct. started to do some creative things with growth. Facebook it, and Uber. Yeah, Facebook, like the, the ones that we still kind of look back at, Dropbox, some of these companies that really set the precedence of how to do this. And that data analytics section, growth marketers became much more ubiquitous within companies because marketers could have, they could actually have access to tools and have much more tooling to do things that usually you could not have done in the past without engineers. And, the, and growth marketing became, I think, the terminology around growth marketers became quite blurry. One quick thing, do you yearn for any one of those eras more than the other? Like, was there an era you're like, ah, that, if I could just stay in that era, that was like the <laughs> funnest time. And I wish we didn't have to move past that era. Because I've got mine in mobile and social. I always think that early stage where like Google search worked really well, people were not that good at any of this. It was all quite new. I wish we could stay in that ha. stage forever. <laughs> so... There's something interesting what you just said, which you need to reflect on, Kieran, here, which is what you yearn for, what you want to look back to, is a phase where you had personally a competitive advantage over the rest yes. of the market. Right? Correct. Okay? Right. That is true for all of us. Like, we all, as in our, in our businesses, at least, right, in our professional lives, wants to be better than the rest of the market. That is something that the best people, the best teams can repeat over and over. Most people, they, they, they peak at one point because they made the right bet. They're on the, the upwards trend. They, they picked the right solution. They started unbundling before everyone else or the opposite, right? But it's before everyone else. And the market is just catching up to that. They are doing great. The question is, can you repeat that? Can you feel, get a sense for that trend and repeat over and over. And that is extremely important. Personally, I was on growth marketing by happenstance before it was a big thing. Right. And that, I, I owe a lot of my career and to my success to that luck. Absolutely. But the capability of doing that over and over again is, I think, what defines me. Like right. if you look at when I entered Apple in 2003, and when Apple like became successful and the iPhone and all of that, when you look at you know when I entered like technological marketing and when that growth happened, like over and over again. And so it's a challenge. But can I be on the leading edge of AI driven marketing right now or not? Or am I done? That's well, the I question. Well, I would argue your, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I would argue your skill set is actually the right skill set for the next evolution because whenever we've talked and you've talked me through some of the things you've done, your skill set is like creatively finding ways to stitch together technology and use data in very creative ways to create these kind of like personalized experiences for prospects. That's that 216 to 222 stage where 
that data analytics became much more prevalent in how we did marketing, right? Marketers became much more like technologists or the best marketers did because there's so much, as you said, there's so much unbundling and tooling that you can learn. And, and like that same skill set, I think is applicable in that generative AI and the personalization yeah. we still do as marketers in a lot of cases. I think you said this in your article, a lot of it still is pretty obviously personalized. And the thing that happens is like the customer becomes more aware of that. Like the first time they see it, oh, like, this is cool. This person's reaching out to me. The second time, oh, wow. Like they're still reaching out to me in this very personal way. The third time, okay, this is all I've heard about this. This is automation. And the fourth time it's like, everyone is doing the same thing. And so it's Absolutely. like really hard to distinguish yourself. And so maybe that takes us into like the thing we really want to touch on here is this AI, you know, the next wave, the next, the next era is this AI era. And maybe just talk a little bit about what is the 10, if I'm listening to this, I want the 10 X opportunity. Like how should I think about this as an opportunity for me? How can I do personalization at scale? What, what do you think that is? Like, what do you think is the, the opportunity we should be most cognizant about? So, so the first thing I want to say is a couple of thoughts that come to mind here. The first one is like, why do we want to personalize? Like, do we want to personalize for the sake of personalization? And if it works, why does it work? And why have we been doing it? So a lot of things here. First, I enjoy this stuff. And I think, as you said, I'm pretty good at it. Why am I good at it? Because there's two things I enjoy in, in work. One, I love technology. I'm a marketer, but I'm a true lover of technology. Like all of my stuff and all of what I, all of my trinkets are technology trinkets in life. Right. That's, that's my stuff. Okay. I enjoy that. I worked in IT security a while back. And so I know how the web uh, and computers actually work. Okay. That makes me good at it. The second thing is I love human psychology. And I read a lot of human psychology books, how humans work. So I understand how computers work and I understand how humans work. Okay, if you go down the second path, personalization works based on two key factors, right? One is it feels relevant, right? If you personalize well, it feels relevant. And the, the, the second is going to be reciprocity. Reciprocity is super, super important. I have this, this typical thought experiment that I offer to people when I'm trying to like convince them of the importance of personalization and of reciprocity. Let's say that you have at home, you have a, a mailbox, a snail mail mailbox for letters, right? In this mailbox, you get mostly junk mail. Okay. And you take all that junk mail and what do you do? All right? You throw it out. Like 99% of the time you throw it out. And let's say that now you have another mail. This is an envelope. It's uh, scribbled. It's written very obviously by like an old grandma wrote it by hand and like licked the stamp and put the stamp on the envelope, right? And wrote your name behind it, <laughs> right? For the return <laughs> mail, right? You're very, it's very obviously like human written. Right. How likely are you, Kieran, to take this envelope and throw it in the trash without opening it? Very unlikely because yeah, it's gonna stand very, out from the noise. You would be a sociopath. If you throw it out, <laughs> right? You would be like off the charts <laughs> because you would have no curiosity mm -hmm. and you would have no respect for that person. Let's think about it. Let's imagine now you throw it out. You're forced to throw it out. You feel bad for that old grandma, right? In your, in, in, in your, in your guts, you feel bad. That is reciprocity. Okay. Because somebody went through the effort of writing you an envelope by hand. I'm not even sure I could do that these days, right? And right. send it to you, okay? That is the, the feeling we want to reproduce as marketers when we engage with our audience. If we create the same feeling, they will open. And that is why you've seen technology-wise over the past couple of years, many different platforms that are meant to create that feeling whether it is stuff like Loom and all of the video recorders, which eventually, you know, were meant to give you the perception that somebody put some effort into reaching out to you. They recorded themselves. And then there was, you know, remember there was like all those platforms where you had like the whiteboard with the auto whiteboard writing? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, everyone had one of those videos at some point in time, personalized. Exactly. At a point in time. That's right. a key phrase. It works until it doesn't. Right, exactly. Right? becomes commoditized. Eventually, right. everybody catches up and like, oh, 
yeah, there's no effort in this. This is junk mail. Right. So you got to, as a marketer, you got to stay on the, on the upwards trend, on the cutting edge of things that your audience has not caught up to yet. You got to impress them like, maybe this is human. Maybe I should put in my reciprocity like switch on and I should look at it. Right. Okay. And let's talk about why AI may be a 10x improvement on what exists through the lens of one of your campaigns. And I'm going to call one out and we can edit this out if you don't want to talk about this one. <laughs> no but, I, but, I, but I always remember the one you told me when, I think it was when you were at Gorgias and that's probably Gorgias, a bit wrong. yeah. Yeah. Gorgias. It was, it was when you ingested all of the data to find out when there were snowstorms. Yeah. Right. And yeah. And, and so if you're open to talking through that, because I think sure. we've talked about it publicly before. And then maybe talk about- I have about, no worries. Yeah, yeah. Talk about why you think, like in an AI world, how that campaign is- potentially like 10x better? Or what, what are the opportunities to AI to make something like that so much more better? Yeah, That's, so, so there's two campaigns I can cover that I think are a good example. And, and both touch on something a slightly in that direction, but also a bit new, which is they provide value. So both are outbound campaigns. I'm a big fan of outbound. If you ask me, is outbound email here to stay? Absolutely, outbound works great. I have one key trick in my, I'd say, outbound like trick basket that is more important than all the others. In my first email, I almost never talk of my company about my product. I try always to talk about them and to provide something valuable, insightful to then create that reciprocity. I'll give you an example. I was at Gorgeous, which is a, a support platform for e-commerce merchants. Think Zendesk, but for Shopify merchants, okay? Works really well. And the key, let's say, channel for merchants these days is social, right? So think of something like Instagram. Very, very important for e-commerce. What we did is we automated something, a little script, a scraper that would monitor the Instagram pages of all of the 100,000 merchants uh, that are, are important to us in the US. We're monitoring all the posts and looking for the post which had negative comments from their customers, from their prospects. Okay, people complaining about the products, about the company. And once we found one through sentiment analysis, which is a form of like simplified language processing, AI, we would then monitor that page again, that post again and again for the next 48 hours to see has the brand, has somebody from the brand responded, handled it. If not, we would screenshot automatically that page inject it into an email and send it to say, hey, Kieran, you're the head of the product team, head of like marketing at this B2C e-commerce company. Just let you know, we love your product, but somebody has been like complaining on your Instagram posts and you haven't responded and you should. End of the email. That's it. This email has a couple of key things for it. It's factual, right? You can check the Instagram post, which is a link, and you'll find the complaint. And it, so it's there. You can just it is, it's true, right? If you haven't handled a complaint on Instagram that is is there, you, sh you should. It's just like, it's good, like, no, it's e-commerce, like one one right? So it's, it's valuable and there's no ask. What can you do when you receive this as the head of product at this B2C company? Send it, you forward it to somebody in your team in charge of social, you reply, say, hey, thanks. Cool, thanks for catching it. I have now created reciprocity. It's, right. going to, it's going to be super hard for you as my recipient to ignore my second email now. Very, very hard. Because I've, I've now created value and you owe me one. Okay? Mm. This was a lot of work for the team to pull off. A lot of work. Especially the copywriting and handling all of the edge cases. A lot of this can now be handled by large language models. The detection is the sentiment analysis correct has nobody responded? Is that somebody from the brand? How should we write about it? Is this important, not important? Who's the right person? All of that used to take multiple marketers, engineers to build and to maintain. And that's why you needed growth teams to pull it off. More and more, this will be something that can be handled mostly through a simplified AI model. And that's just right. one example. Right.
There's two things you mentioned there that I think are really important. First of all, it sounds like you start your process in terms of personalization by how can I provide this person with value? Yep. How can I provide them with something they're going to say, oh, this is actually was a valuable use of my time to actually read this email. And I don't think most people start there. Most people start with like, how do I get you to like open, click through and do something for me? Whereas you're like, how do I give you something where you're just like, hey, that this was like exactly. worth my time. And then the second exactly. thing is, the second thing is that, ca that campaign, I think that is an amazing campaign. And that campaign in an AI world probably looks and feels the same, but how it is executed on is very different. And I think that's what you're saying is like, it, it's Absolutely. collapsed into like a singular LLM model, maybe a singular tool that can do all this for you. And where it took a bunch of marketers and engineers, there's like a generalist who can actually put all of that together. I'll give you another example. I have this other example that we're running right now at Ramp, which shows the situation where we do not have the ability to provide value. Ramp is a fintech company, provides, let's say, financial software, as well as credit cards and financial solutions to businesses in the US. Target market audience is CFOs, VPs of finance. And for better or worse, like, they don't shout about the finances on Twitter. They don't talk about like their needs on Twitter. So you can't really like, there's no place you could go and scrape right. and find insightful information. And cr it's very hard to write an email to provide value without any of the knowledge. None. Okay. Very hard. So obviously we have all of the intent campaigns based on all the intent signals, uh, but we also have something which is very, let's say, AI driven, which is the sports betting campaign. Now it's important to understand that target market is CFOs in the US, and they have all gone to colleges, all of these CFOs, like 99.9%, okay? And in the US, think that as a 50% French person that did not know, college sports is extremely important, mm, yeah. like even in your later life. It yeah. stays important <laughs> your entire life. I realized right? that as well. It's weird. Exactly. But... <laughs> as a European, I was like, is that? But it is, okay? <laughs> and so what the team pulled off is a campaign that looks at which college the CFO went at. What are the upcoming games, college games? Who are they gonna compete against? What are the odds of that team winning or losing in the upcoming game? Then making a quick bet and looking at the, we care about the account and then sending an email saying, hey, Karen, I saw that your college like NYU and the, the team, I don't know, like the, the Sharks are gonna compete against like the Bulls like next week. I'm betting you 50 bucks or a call with me that your team's going to lose. <laughs> End of the email. <laughs> right? I'm st I can't talk about that company because I don't know anything, but I'm not right. talking about my product. I'm not trying to pitch them on my product. I am just startling them with something uniquely different. No one does, that, does this in the market. No one. Something they care about. Something that people like betting on sports, especially if you don't have to spend anything. Right? The worst you're going to do is going to lose 30 minutes on your... That feels okay, right? The acceptance rate is super high. Our response rate on that email is double digits. Okay, wow. acceptance rate on the bet is high. We win or we win. Why? Because either we spent 50 bucks and we almost always have a call after that, or we don't spend 50 bucks and we have a call with the CFO. <laughs> yeah. And so it's a $50 call, yeah. right? Yeah. Which is great. Like, Better than the super Starbucks good or the catch. Amazon vouchers that everyone does. Yeah. And so, so, okay, so what's important here? A lot of creativity, a lot of technology. This is like this, I'm scraping, automation, betting. All of this is written by GPT-4, by the way. Like the entire email is written by GPT wow. and like GPT gets the upcoming games, picks the games, picks the bets and, and all of that, right? Okay. The only thing we do is like we, we obviously put the, the gift card amount and all of that. It is low volume, super high performance. This for now, it's not commoditized. People respond to it because they feel reciprocity, they feel, it feels personal. This is yeah. a great use of AI to create a wonderful campaign. The interesting part about that is when people talk about personalization and personalization will become very commoditized through AI. And I think that too, I do, I do think that is true, but it still depends on how you choose to wield that power. And there's still those who are going to be much more creative in how they wield that power, right? So like if you get 10 people and give them the same technology, so the same technology you have, 
they probably don't start at your starting point. They probably start at, oh, I can get that name. I can get like any information and say, oh, like you, I know this about you. And then, hey, do you want to call? Because I see these problems in your company and their commonalities, like companies like you have these problems and I can do that cycle much better. But where you start from, I still think that people will have some unique skill set to start from a different place than 90% of the other people who have access to the same technology. Do you, do you agree with that, that, that it becomes commoditized for a lot, but there's still going to be people who are much better than others? I think that's fair. And I think that's why growth teams are going to change in the future. As AI platforms, not just AI, but the, the tools that are empowered by AI are going to make a lot of the work we've been doing easier. It's going to shift the structure of a growth team. And I think we're, we're going to need a uh, fewer specialists. Like I'm not going to need like that many people who are extremely good at about SEO or about paid because like a lot of that is it's a playbook and the AI can be really good at optimizing towards a playbook. But the sheer creativity and like coming up with something that doesn't exist, something that is startling, net new, that for now, for now is still better in the hands of a human. Right. But that is a very small percentage of people that have the ability yes. to do that. So what do you think happens to all of the other people who have made their careers being channel experts, being experts within a single part of the marketing stack? What, it's what time to change. Do? It's time to change. <laughs> what do they change to? <laughs> like a yeah, different this... industry, different job, or the same, same job, but learn different skills? Yeah, I mean, it depends on what they're capable of. Yeah. But a, a lot of the time, people ask me, why do I share all of those tactics? Like, why do I make them public, right? And not keep them for myself, all right? Well, I think in some ways I've come up with a strategy which is the, the crack dealer strategy. And the crack dealer strategy is what we, I have kids myself, right? And so what you tell your kids is don't take candies, don't take stuff from like unknown people because it could be drugs, right? And then you'll be hooked on the drugs, okay? <laughs> I don't know if that's true. As a kid, nobody ever offered me drugs for free, but maybe that's something in the US, okay? The important part is I give you things that work that most people are not capable of producing or coming up on their own. It works. People, companies, founders get hooked on that. They want more of those early, thought-provoking, groundbreaking campaigns. And the number of people the percentage of people who are capable of doing those things is very small. Very I'm small. one of them. I'm just right. making the rest of the market harder and harder for the people who are not exceptionally good at this. But if you're a founder today and they want to build their marketing team for the future, they, want, they don't want to build their marketing team for the data and analytics era. They want to start building for the AI era now because they're like pre-seed, seed, so they have the opportunity to do that. Who are they trying to hire? Like, who would you recommend them to hire in terms of like the different types of skill sets you think they should be going after? Yeah, and I think it depends on the stage a lot. If you look at early stage, you're gonna want maybe one or one person or, or a very small team of like three people, which are almost like have this, this founder mindset, very risk prone. You don't know what's gonna work. A lot of the time I see teams and they're just trying the good team are trying things, trying things, trying things. Eventually, they land on, on something that works, okay? I I can go a bit faster because I've been doing this for a while, and so I, I know which things are more likely to work. But you got to have people that move very fast. So they, they fail, they pivot, they try again. That has the, this founder mentality. You're not trying to build campaigns with a huge cost and like a, like a long-term rollout. That's not what you want. So once... One person, then as soon as you can, three people, the, the marketer slash growth mindset, the engineer and the analyst, right? You can mix that a bit, but it, it's a bit of that, right? Because you want solid data. You want to be able to understand, is this working? Can we MVP our way through it? So low code approach, you know, maybe use Zapier to like make it happen. And eventually maybe you want to like build a scalable version in-house and that's okay. Right? You can have like those different phases for every idea. The key success there is how many things can you try in a period of time? You got to think of yourself like a, an angel investor, all right? Nine times out of 10, it's going to fail. 
for that one idea. Right. That one idea is going to like pay back for all the failures and more. Okay. And later stage, you've got to be able to scale that. And it's extremely hard. Like there's a lot of growth teams, series A, series B. If you look at like later stage companies like series C, series D, like the growth team tends to disappear. That is extremely hard to, to, to preserve, to maintain a growth team. But if you can, then you have amazing velocity. You can have like multiple growth pods that are shipping, you know, three or four, five ideas every two weeks, right? right. To like create that, that compound effect of that competitive mode. Yeah. Yeah. You think they disappear because later stage companies take less, take less risks. So they have Absolutely. some established channels and they just want to tweak the knobs and dials and keep on optimizing for iterative returns. Their appetite for risk goes down because right. there's, there's more at stake, there's more to lose. That's the first thing. A growth team is disruptive by nature. It has engineers, which are not in engineering. It has marketers, which are not in the marketing team. It operates like a product team, it's not part of product, and it owns the revenue, but it's not part of the sales team. So like, it is disruptive to the traditional organization. And to now, my failure and the failure of all of my peers has been, we haven't been able to establish a standard of a growth team exists here and it's siloed next to the other C-level function. It's by and large, not the case, okay? And so it's really hard to maintain as the organization evolves and it's gonna shift sometimes in marketing, sometimes in product, and it just like basically it rips apart the growth team over time. Right. And if you're one of those three people, I assume you would recommend that they, they have to have an interest in how all of this translates into AI, like how AI technology is the place to start with any of these kind of experiments you want to run? Yeah, I think you gotta you gotta really think how can I automate things that the rest of my audience, my market, thinks is not automatable? How can you break through the barrier of doubt thanks to AI? All right, it's really just like a a, a means to an end. All right, you could the, the the way I like to say is like. You want to get people engaged, say that you give them a Tesla for a phone call, you're going to get 100% conversion rate on that offer, right? <laughs> but the CAC to LTV is bad, <laughs> okay? It's bad. <laughs> so if you think about it, how can you have the best CAC to LTV? That's through crafting something of value, which is not a Tesla, but it's something that costs almost nothing to you, but is worth a lot to your recipient. In my yeah. case, you've seen, I've given you examples of finding problems in their social. I found like maybe some sports betting game or bet that is worth to them. And I have like dozen other examples. It costs me almost nothing to do that once it's running, but it is, it has a high value. The last thing that's important is why do growth teams work? And, and especially at mid stage, it's because most of your competitors do not have one. And they operate with traditional marketing, which means not only they're not going to use AI, they're not going to use any of the modern like low-code tools, they're going to go slow. If they go slow, they have to be thoughtful about their bets. They have to be thoughtful about their failure rates. And they're going to ship a lot fewer things. They are less likely to find a big outlier. I don't come in with saying, hey, this is the one thing we should do this quarter. I don't know. I don't know at all. We just ship a ton of things and then we scale the hell out of those that work. Right. And because few of our competitors are capable of doing that, we create an experience to our audience, which is significantly better. Right. That is how you win. You create a team that's capable of creating repeatedly an experience that is much better than your competitors, and the people are going to be, wow, like, this is amazing, right. right? The job of a marketing team, people forget, the job of a marketing team is to create an experience that is as good or better pre-product than what people are going to find in the product. You create value too, if you do a good job, and then the product creates value, okay? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of this conversation has been how do you start from the from the you know the point of value? Like, how do you create value before you ever try to extract value? And not many people will start from that point. 
maybe we'll just end on one of the things that I think a lot about, which is as we are entering this kind of AI area, there's the, in the data and analytics era, it was hard for these things to get too commoditized because there was the idea plus the complexity of executing on that idea. And you needed like talent on both ends. You needed the talent to be able to come up with the ideas and the talent to execute. And when you come into AI, I think what we're saying is today, as it stands, you still need the human to do the ideas. You still need someone who is like, has creative ideas, but the speed of execution and the complexity of execution is like going down dramatically with all of this AI technology, which means personalization for the customer should get much better. Like the experience should get much better. But for the marketer, the stuff that they do gets commoditized much faster. There was a yep. really great AI research pa paper released a couple of weeks ago. And it talked about like the experts who have spent like years becoming really great at their craft, losing their competitive edge because it takes the kind of good person, gives them technology to be much, much better without having to have done that hard work. How do you think about commoditization? Like when you, you sit down and you, you know, you're one person who's built a career on these kind of personalization at scale tactics. Do you think your work gets commoditized much faster? Do you think marketers' work gets commoditized much faster? How do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. I do think it will get commoditized. I think the cycles are shortening. To bring us back to the beginning of this podcast, those cycles are getting shorter and shorter, and it's going to be extremely hard for any one person to be repeatedly on the cutting edge. Okay? There's going to be oh, thousands of AI-empowered tools in every channel, for every tactic. For now, we are not in the bundling phase. We're still in an unbundling of the AI. You can see all that, right? Maybe one day it will all bundle back and then one person can handle, oversee the, all of the campaigns, all of the acquisition strategies. For now, what's gonna happen is that we're gonna need people who are really good at psychology, at technology, to understand how can they connect the existing bricks and pipes of available technology and tools to create those experiences, to create something that's truly different, remarkable, right? They're all different platforms, different tools for a specific thing, a video AI empowered tool, an email empowered tool. How can you create an experience that makes sense from the beginning to the end? And for that, for now, you still need a great marketer. Right, right. Okay, so we all have a job for a little bit of time until you just have the AI being able to tell the AI to do all of the work. <laughs> and then we, need, There's to work, one then we thing. need to learn crafts, arts and crafts. There's one more thing. That one more thing is what happens when instead of the people being used to and the, to the personalized messages and you know, being commoditized. And we use AI increasingly to improve our communication, our emails, our web pages, personalize them more and more. At one point, those communications will become indistinguishable from a human written one. Yeah, I totally agree. What happens to our monkey brains at that point when we can't differentiate? Is this human or is it computers? From a reciprocity standpoint, if you don't know whether the grandma is a grandma, there's two things that can happen. You either stop trusting anything you see, anything you read, or you trust everything. It's like there's, there's no in between because you won't be able to tell. My take is it's going to be, we're going to have less trust overall, right? We will push back. We'll have less trust overall about what we read, about how we're being reached out to. And that's going to make the work extremely difficult for marketers to break through that barrier of doubt, which will be extremely high. Right. When you can have AI-driven calls, which we're very close to right now, right? AI Zoom calls, you don't know if the AE on the other side is a human or not. Well, you value their time. Well, you look at, is this information valuable or is this reciprocity? And I think we're going to have to go for, is the information valuable versus reciprocity? which means you will be able to hang up on a call because you don't care because it's not interesting and you won't know if it's a human or not, which <laughs> yeah. is something we can't do right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, you're not, you're not worried about hurting per a person's feelings. One of the things we said on the show is that the first mover advantage has never been more 
prevalent in the like the AI era, the first mover advantage is like even more so in that era compared to any of the other eras because everything gets commoditized so fast. Do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Which is why you need to be able to move fast and test things repeatedly. Like yeah. the one defining thing about me compared to a lot of my peers at my career stage is a lot of them have picked the tools they like and they're not taking new intros. They're not talking to the YC founder that is creating a Martech platform because they, they're not interested. I am because I love technology. I love talking to the founders and I want to stay on the cutting edge. So I take those calls. Most of them are not useful, but sometimes, sometimes you land on a Zapier or something like that. Yeah. If you look in Twitter history, way back to like 2014 or 2013, you will find a tweet from me that says something like, I heard about this Zapier thing launching. This is either the greatest hoax or the best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> we can hunt it down, put it up and put it You can hunt screen. it down yeah. and put it on screen. And this is a good example of me always looking for the new stuff and trying random stuff that pops up in the internet because, because it could be the next you big thing. You never know. Yeah, you never know. You never know. You never know. It That's worked out for Zapier. It worked out for segments. And I, right. I maintain relationships with dozens of founders of things like this because I could, that could lead me to being one of the guys on the cutting edge with the early access. Yeah. That's key to the success. Yeah. That's a great way to think about cool. it. Cool. Hunt it down. Cool. Awesome. This is fun. A lot of, lot of good stuff. Yeah. Gee, this has been awesome. I think people have got really good perspective on like how they can shift into that AI era and start to really think more creatively about their ideas. I think that should be the takeaway for people is like, if you are doing the same stuff as everyone else, that stuff has become, become, become commoditized so much faster. And so you have to up your game. Like it's on us to get better. And I think that should be the takeaway. So we appreciate you coming on, dropping all of that knowledge. This is Marketing Against the Grain, and we will see you all next time. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history, calls, support tickets, emails, and here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot, grow better.